Okay. So um, this was Mishnah 19, and the Commander Rebbe had a kind of a creative, uh, uh, out of the box uh, way of reading the text. And he uh, used it as a, a kind of a way of saying um, that Veda uh, Ma, that our ultimate goal in knowing is to know that we don't know. And uh, what are we? What is our life? Uh, every morning we actually have a, a litany where we go through things like that and we say, you know, we really, uh, um, we shouldn't be too puffed up about ourselves. Um, and and uh, in the end, again, the, 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 the Commander Rebbe basically echoes these kinds of basic ideas. Um, uh, our source of meaning uh, is in attaching ourselves to the ultimate and to finding a way to live a life that reflects that, uh, which uh, is one way of thinking about the Torah and, uh, and the commandments. And the Apikoras, the heretic, he identifies with our inner evil inclination, not somebody out there that doesn't agree with us, but our own sense of doubt, questioning, cynicism. And uh, finally, he was saying that if we, if we say to ourselves, well, you know what, the, the whole point of all of this is in the end, we're not really gonna know anything. The true knowing is not to know, then what's the point of trying to know? We'll get discouraged and we won't even try to work on that. And uh, that's where um, uh, he uh, says, no, but we should understand that that's really very, uh, very important. You need to go through that process to get to that ultimate non-knowing because the ultimate non-knowing is different than just plain ignorance. It's a deep and actually very meaningful comprehension. So now I'm gonna share the screen to go to the last part um, of what he wrote. So we're, we, we got to the next, um, we got to the last two sections here. So I'm, I'm just gonna read it to, so that we we'll sp won't spend the whole time just trying to figure out how he's uh, trying to communicate. But if you will not be diligent in studying Torah day and night, you will not be able to reach the end purpose of knowing that we should know that we do not know. Rather, you will certainly fool yourself and think that you are one of the greats of the world, knowing all that is secret, a scholar and a mystic. And then you are apt, heaven forbid, to be caught in the net of the heretic, as we have seen with our own eyes. So many who are uprooted from this world and the coming world by means of their arrogant, willful hearts, lacking the end purpose of knowing that we must know that we do not know. But they went into alien investigations in the nonsensical matters of the evil inclination until they were turned into heretics. May the merciful control one save us. So he's emphasizing very much, and as I said when I introduced him, this rabbi was one of the deep, deep, deep scholars and thinkers of the 19th century. Um, he spent day and night studying and probing and thinking and teaching and, and writing. So it's not like he's sitting in some kind of blissful, non-knowing state. Um, but what he says is all of that knowing needs to be uh, put into the perspective of what is that knowing compared to what, you know, what really is. Um, and the evil inclination is the ego in, in many ways. It's, it's that sense of arrogance, as he says, um, I was reading, uh, you know, it's a big mistake to read comments when people put, uh, uh, put up things, whether it's on Facebook or a news article or something like that. And then when you read the comments, the comments end up really sometimes being very, very, uh, um, depressing to see how people, uh, you know, express themselves. And it's a lot of this, like, what do you think you, who do you think you are? And there's a lot of like, basically just ego thumping that that people throw out each other and then it and it works even on more where you would think there would be some some sense of uh, wanting to get to the truth you know like a letter to the editor or uh, a letter about somebody who wrote a review of a book 
And I was reading one of these things yesterday and I was just like so uh, amazed about how it was all the ego, it was all ego trips. It was all, so you think you know how to evaluate what, what I wrote and oh, you think you, what you, you don't, you, you think you understand my review, you know, what do you know? You know, and, and um, the famous joke, you know, look who's a nothing, right? Um, we, can, we can say, it cause it's a classic. It's uh, Kol Nidre Eve, right? Uh, and uh, everyone is getting ready for Yom Kippur. And there's a lot of tension in the air. People have uh, anxieties and expectations. And the simple uh, shamish, the person who's uh, in charge of like just taking care of making sure everybody has a prayer book, everybody has a seat to sit in. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the ritual custodian is so worked up and so, um, you know, so upset and he's, and he's going about his, his, his business. And, and then the rabbi walks in. And of course, the rabbi is the rabbi. Um, so I hear. And uh, um, the rabbi comes up to the ark and, uh, and says, Master of the universe, here we are, the holiest night of the year. Please overlook all of my shortcomings. What am I? I'm I'm a nothing. And uh, and there's like a hush in the in the in the, the crowd that's that's gathering in in the sanctuary, and it makes a tremendous impression on everybody. And then the cantor. This is supposed to be the Cantor's big night. You know, this is right before Kol Nidre. Kol Nidre is, is the, the moment for the Cantor. Cantor sees that, you know, there's a, there's a scene being stole, stolen right from under his nose. So, so he goes in front of the ark and he says, Oh, Rabboni Shalala, master of the universe. I'm about to pray before you, but who am I? What am I? I'm a nothing. And ooh, everybody is like very, very uh, moved and impressed. And then this little Shamish who's been walking around trying to get everything ready has so shaken by, by, uh, by this, you know, wave after wave of spiritual <coughs> um, inspiration that he can't, he can't help himself. And he runs over to the ark and he throws himself down in front of the ark and he goes, oh, master of the universe, I try my best, but what am I? Who am I? I'm, I'm, I'm just a nothing. And the cantor is standing next to the rabbi and he goes with his elbow and he goes, oh, look who thinks he's a nothing. So, um, you know, so, so we can turn all of this stuff into, uh, into uh, ego trips uh, if we're not watching out for that, for that apicorus. Okay, and now before whom me, if name me, Ata'amel, you labor. That you not say, until when must I tire myself out so much to subdue my evil inclination and evil traits and dark bitterness, melancholia, that is as tough as death. And moreover, it, the evil inclination confuses me whenever I'm studying Torah or at prayer with evil, alien thoughts and distractions and stupid thoughts and questions about nothing. And I stand always in enormous danger, unable to vanquish him completely until I will actually become what? And ma, and nothingness. So how am I gonna do this? Well, this is a huge battle. Know that all this labor and effort is lifne me, is before whom? Before, not in front of, but prior to your having grasped what is, what it brings you to enter the 50th, I'm sorry, there's a typo there, the 50th gate, me. But when you do apprehend the 50th gate, then you are a free person. As explained in the book, Chesed Lavram, look there. And then the appearance of this world is removed from him completely and he becomes enduring nature, stamped with all good traits and with holy thoughts, gazing, and seeing the inner rooms of the chariot, how fortunate the eye that beholds all this. So his parting thought is, is that there becomes 
a, a, a place, if you keep on fighting, if you keep on pushing, if you keep on um, enduring through all of the doubts and, and uh, frustrations and depressions, um, you get to the me. And me, mem yud equals 50. Mem is 40, yud is 50, those two letters. And that's the 50th gate of understanding. And that is the high, high apprehension of the Almighty. So that when you break through the wall, you know, people that, that run, sometimes they say, you know, you, you, you hit the wall. And then if you keep on going, you, get, you, you push yourself through the wall. And that's what he's saying here. That if you, if you really keep on going, you will push yourself through the wall and get from that sense of nothingness to a sense of fullness. And everything then uh, finds its place in peace. So that's, that's uh, the Kamarna Rebbe's uh, um, teaching. Okay, now we're going to Mishnah 20. Um, the next teaching, and this is Rabbi Tarfon. So uh, Rabbi Tarfon was also a student. He wasn't singled out as one of the five students of Rabbi Yochanan and Zakkai. Maybe he came in a little later, um, but he was a student of Rabbi Yochanan and Zakkai, and he was a major, major uh, figure in uh, the rabbinic world um, in the, the first uh, beginnings of, of, of rabbinic Judaism. He was a Kohen, he was a priest. And he, when he was young, I don't know how young, he still, he was, he, he the temple was still standing when he was uh, a young person. So he had some remembrance of the priestly activities, the priestly world of, of ministering to, to God and to, and to the people in the temple. And then he survived the destruction of the temple and the, and the Roman uh, destruction. And he grew to be one of the major rabbinic figures of his time. Um, and uh, uh, he uh, was also apparently very, very wealthy. And uh, um, he had you know, all kinds of uh, estates uh, and, and, you know, uh, land holdings and so on and so forth. And um, one really amazing story that I want to share about him is that um, they tell the story that he, at one point, yeah, I need a background to this, he's a priest, right? So priests are able to eat truma priestly gifts, um, and nobody else is allowed to eat that. These are holy gifts that are meant to sustain the priest. Now, of course, priests are supposed to be, according to the you know, picture that is painted in the, in the, in the uh, Torah, a priest has no land because they have no uh, um, tribal uh, um, allotment. They have no tribal estate. By the time Rabbi Tarfon is living, there are no tribal estates for anybody. Every, it's a free market. You know, people buy land and, and sell land and acquire uh, whatever it is that they acquire. Um, and, and nobody's land is going back to their original tribe. Nobody is losing their land in, in that kind of way. Um, so he was wealthy and he was also, um, because he was so prominent and so respected, he was the recipient of a tremendous amount of support from the rest of the population who gave him these, these priestly gifts. So the story, it's not a story, it's, a, you know, it's just a, a fact or whatever. Um, the story is that he married 300 destitute women, right? In one shot. So, so like a little Reverend Moon kind of thing. Um, he, why? Because the, the spouse of a Kohen is also able to eat from the priestly gifts. The, 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 the priest's household is eligible to eat the gifts that are given to the priest. So once the, the, the woman who was very poor 
uh, on her own. She was not uh, of the priestly family. She couldn't eat that food. But once she was married to Rabbi Tarfon, then she was part of his family, and then she could eat the food. So that's the kind of largesse that he uh, was, was uh, you know, uh, you know uh, thought of having. That, uh, you know, he, you know, it's, it was, you know, like, get, like marrying for the green card, right? Marrying somebody for a green card. So he, he, um, he married hundreds of women simply to feed them, simply to make it sure that they would be able to have um, food in their, in their mouth. So this is a little bit of a background of this man. And now let's see uh, what he says. So we have our standard ap approach. We've got our basic array of translations that, are, that will talk about family. They're all, they all basically you know, fit in the same family. And then we'll ask Josie to give us uh, Rabbi Shapiro's translation. So who's going to read for us their translate? All right, Gerilyn. Good. That was quick. Rabbi Tarfon taught, the day is short, the task is great. The workers indolent, the reward bountiful, and the master insistent. Okay. So, and I'm like, we we probably have some other synonyms here and there for some of these words. Anybody want to share a, a variation? Beryl, you, you want to do that? I was hysterical. Rabbi Tarfun said, the day is short, the task is great, the laborers are idle, and the wage is great, and the master is urgent. Okay. So um, just a, 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 a um, you know, a literal translation again. What did we have, Geraldine? What did you have about the laborers? The workers indolent. Indolent is different than idle, right? Um, they're lazy. They're lazy. They don't. They're not so interested in working. Yes, yeah, Sarita. Ours is on the laborers are sluggish. Sluggish. So. Um, Sluggish again is a little bit of a neutral kind of uh, word. Um, it you know when the work slowdowns happen. You now why why does a work slowdown sometimes uh, you know happen in labor situations? So um, it could be for all kinds of reasons. In this particular case, what is being said by Rabbi Tarfon is the workers are just plain lazy uh, because they are getting paid a living wage. The, 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 the uh, reward is very great. There's every work incentive uh, that you can think of is, is in place, but workers, the workers are lazy. Um, okay, um, before we get to unpacking this, uh, a little bit of uh, a variation. Josie, you got it? You gotta un unmute, please. It's not very different. <clears throat> okay. Rabbi Tarfa. Tarfon teaches, the day is short, the task is long, the workers are lazy, the stakes are high, the master is demanding. Okay, so it's interesting that he has not the reward, but the stakes. The stakes are high, an interesting way to, to turn that around. So, okay, so who, who is Rabbi Tarfon talking about? What situation is he describing? The students who are supposedly learning and okay, focusing. so so how would that whole thing work out then? That he he doesn't see the degree of attention that he would want. Well, what about the beginning phrases? What how do the beginning phrases you know? Yeah, yeah, you don't have a, you don't have a lot of time, and you got a big job ahead of you. Why don't we have a lot of time? Because our lives are limited. So does that apply only to students? No. No, but isn't he, I thought he was mainly concerned with those who are studying with him. Well, he doesn't use the word study at all, right? Um, and, you know, if we start from that beginning phrase, he says it, it could apply to anybody oh. and everybody, right? Everybody's time is short. And uh, the, that's, that the day is short. 
Vehamalacha, that's the Hebrew word. Malacha means the work, the labor. When we, when we uh, work six days, those are six days of malacha, six days of working. And then Shabbat is the day that we're supposed to take Amen. a rest, right? Um, so he doesn't say what the malacha is. You're right. If, if you happen to be a student and you're aspiring to become a scholar, to be a Torah uh, a teacher and so on, then that's your work. At least that's some of your work. Um, and you're going to need to uh, account for your time. Are you using it well? But it could be anybody's work. And in fact, even if you are studying Torah, what other kinds of work do we have? What kind of work could be possibly mentioned here, be, be referred to here? There's so much work, says Rabbi Tarfon. There's so much work. The time is short and there is so much work to be done. What kind of work is there to be done? Yeah, Gerilyn. To learn. To learn. To study, to learn. Okay, to study, to learn. Okay, that's one kind of work. And yeah, Merle. Um, the commentary in the book that I have, which is Rabbi uh, Shmuley Yanklovitz. Yeah. 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 He says, um, yeah, our days are short, our lives are busy. We have obligations to meet work, family, health, recreation, and attending to our spiritual needs. So all of those could be. So there you are. So he's expanding it. Um, and he's a, a, a young rabbi uh, active today. And active is definitely the word. I, you know, I don't know how he squeezes in into the short days that he has all the work that he does. Um, uh, so he's, you know, he's, he's already expanding it, not just study. We have like real, I gotta, I gotta go get a quart of milk, you know, for, for, uh, for, for breakfast. I got to throw out the garbage. I got to go to regular work. I got to uh, um, call up somebody uh, who I haven't spoken to in, in, in too long. You know, the, the kinds of things that we have to do are endless, endless. And that's just the external kinds of stuff. Um, we just had a whole, you know, thing that I quoted to you from, from the Kamarna Rebbe uh, that was related to study. But he made it very internal. Look at how much internal work we have to do. Look at how much work we have to do just on our own sense of who we are and how we feel about ourselves so that we can act like a mensch, so that we can act you know, in, in, a, in a decent, responsible way, you know, be a little more kind, be a little more uh, 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 secure in sharing. Um, so many different things. Every single one of us um, has work to do that nobody else can do. Right? Every single one of us has pressing stuff, and it, you know, from the external, you know, uh, sources, and then you know the things that we haven't really quite pulled our act together about. Um, that's all. That's a lot of work. A lot of work. Yeah, Jen, you want to say something? Oh, I'm sorry. I was actually being thinking really shallowly of all the books I haven't read yet, and all the anime I still have on my list to watch. And <laughs> that's actually what I think of when anybody talks about how short our time is. All the like media I want to consume. Basically, it's like ah, there's not enough time for. It. All right, good. That's that's all included. Yes, Sarita. So I'm thinking, you know, not not just. Um, over the course of our life, but even each day, each day is short, and there's literally, just so, there's so many the things to do every mm -hmm. single day. And it's like, how do you choose between them, and how so that by the end of the day, you feel like, okay, I've gotten through enough stuff, right? So even not just thinking about, oh my God, I'm, uh, my life is short in total, but just every single day, there just isn't enough time in every day. Right, right, and uh, yeah, so. And then some of us uh, get frustrated by that and we start beating ourselves up. And that's then work that we have to do. We have extra work to learn how not to beat ourselves up about that. Right? Um, on the other hand, let's not be lazy. Right? That's, that's the thing that, that, uh, that Rabbi Tarfon also says. There is so much work that each of us wants, you know, has to do 
and we're so lazy about it. How does, how does that sit with people? You like being called lazy? Yes, yeah, Rita. So well, one of the things that struck me, I, I mean, the word may actually you know, be lazy, but I, I'm struck with how paralyzing it can be that sometimes when you're you know, faced with just so much that has to be done, that it just paralyzes you and you're unable to do anything. Yeah. Right. Merle. Um, you know, the, a, a popular word of the last couple of decades is multitasking. You know, we're all multitasking and I don't know about you, but I find that when I'm multitasking, I'm not doing anything particularly well. <laughs> now this, this rabbi whose book I have, the um, Yankelovitz, he says, um, uh, life is difficult, disparate ass, uh, balancing. He said, but we must find balance. It is commanded of us to find balance. I guess that's easier said than done. Right, e and easier written than done, right? Uh, so, <laughs> so he writes it, but it's there for us to keep on to keep on contemplating. Um, one of the really, you know, I quoted uh, again. I quoted the Kamarna Rebbe before the Hasidic tradition. One of their very important uh, teachings was he mentions depression and melancholia as as a uh, a danger. And depression is not about being sad, right? There's a lot of things that, that can make us sad in the world um, in, and in our own personal experiences. Um, depression is this kind of uh, force that what Sarita was saying that stops you, that stops you from going forward. And the Hasidic teaching is when that's going on, that's, that's Satan. That's the evil inclination. That's actually the, 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 um, the force that's trying to entrap you to not achieve what you can. And it's so smart because what it does is it plays on your ego. It plays on your sense of ego. When you blame yourself for not doing A, B, C, D, it's as if you're saying, well, because I'm actually supposed very important for me to do A, B, C, and D. Well, guess what? You didn't do A, B, C, and D, and guess what? The sky didn't fall. So maybe it's, you're not as central as you, need, as, you, as you think you are. Now, of course, that is also a tricky uh, uh, you know, place to be in. So, and that becomes the laziness. What's the difference if I do it or not? If I don't do it, somebody else will do it, or it'll get done, or it won't get done. Who cares? Um, we're going to stop in a second. I just want to give the famous uh, teaching that many of you have heard already. Right? Rabbi Simcha Bunim of Prasishka said, he said, put two pieces of paper, one in your right pocket and one in your left pocket. Right? In, in one pocket, you should have a piece of paper that says, the world was created just for me, just for my sake. And in the other pocket, you should put in a piece of paper that says, what am I? I'm nothing but dust and ashes. A little bit like what we were reading before. So, and he says, when you feel all arrogant and, and uh, you know, uh, you think that you're, you know, th you know, hot stuff, take out the piece of paper to remind yourself that, yeah, you're really, you're really just dust and ashes. And when you're depressed and when you're sad and when you're paralyzed and when you feel that, you 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 can't accomplish anything, and and you're just one big gigantic failure and loser. Take the other piece of paper out and understand that nobody else but you is you. So you are irreplaceable. You are indispensable. You're an essential worker. So uh, you know you have to dance that that kind of dance. All right, we'll continue not next week. Next week. Uh, we have a rabbinic candidate coming in, so uh, everyone is invited to uh, you know see what what parts they can they can participate in, so they can uh, meet uh, uh, the the, uh, the the person coming in next week. We will continue hopefully the following week. Okay, Zayg isn't everybody. Bye Take everyone. Care.